planet with 7 billion other people. And each one of those people is individually composed of around 37 trillion cells. Trillion. I think that is a very hard number for us to get our minds around. Um, it, it's hard to conceptualize trillion, much like trying to understand or conceptualize our national debt of $17 trillion. Very hard to conceptualize. However, what I think is much more astounding and amazing than that is that we also have 10 to 20 times more microbes associating with us every day. We are carrying around 10 to 20 times more microbes than we are our own cells. And each of those microbes has set up a certain ecological niche, a certain place in our anatomy that it prefers to be. And it likes to be there based on the lifestyle needs and desires that they have. These microbes might be fungi, they might be viruses, they might be bacteria. But in any case, these microbial groups um, highly occupy various areas of our body, such as our gut, such as our skin, such as our oral cavities. And the reason they set up those spaces, once again, is because of those lifestyle needs. So a microbe that lives in our gut might not be interested in living in our, on our skin. A microbe that lives on our skin might not be interested in living in our oral cavity. So they, they, they assume their niche based on what we can give them. And we cannot live without them. We now know that. They are taking up uh, niches that might otherwise be occupied by disease-causing microbes. They are helping us with our immunology and our defense mechanisms. They are helping us digest our food. They are giving us maybe vitamins that we can't even make. And so they are living where they like to be, much like city folk like to live in the city, country folk like to live in the country. Now, one of the places that we're particularly interested in that we're looking at anatomically with regard to our microbiome is our oral cavity. Our oral cavity is actually composed of a tremendous diversity and number. So both a, a very vast quantity and different types of, of microbes. Overall, we have national or actually international researchers that are working on qualifying what our microbiome overall throughout our entire body is composed of. But we also have specific researchers that are looking at our human oral microbiome, the microbes that are actually just living in our oral cavities. And we're trying to develop a database of quantity and quality, so the numbers, the types of microbes that are there. And what we now know is that on a daily basis, each of us has about 7 billion, a world's population of microbes that regularly are just hanging out in our oral cavities. We also know that there are about 1,000 different types of these microbes, so incredible diversity. A little less than 1,000 right now, but the number grows on a regular basis as to what we're discovering. So a great number, a great diversity. That makes us very, very interested in what that population is doing there. One of the things, and I, I actually think it's doing things that we cannot even begin to imagine that it's doing. One of the things that it is doing is taking up a niche that might otherwise be occupied by pathogens. And a lot of these microbes are what's known as oral streptococcus. Now, when you hear streptococcus, you probably hear the strep part of that, and then you probably, of course, think strep throat. So these are very close cousins to the strep throat organisms that would be a disease-causing agent, a pathogen. But rather than the disease-causing cousin, we have these very friendly little foes, or very friendly little partners um, that are not foes, that allow us to actually do a lot in our mouth. One of the main things, as I said, I'm not sure all of the things that it's doing at this point in time, I don't think anybody is, but one of the main things is that it's taken up a niche that might otherwise be occupied by those foes. And one of the organisms is Streptococcus salivarius. We'll be talking about that guy a little bit more and some of the research out of our lab at KNWU on him. Um, now, we don't want them to be too populous a number. I think that for this size real estate, for this size geography, the world's population of 7 billion in microbes is more than enough. So we don't want 14 billion, we don't want 21 billion, and one of the reasons we don't want that is because what they're actually doing is being able to adhere to the tooth surface. Now some of these microbes, such as Streptococcus salivarius, are genetically able to make this nice little receptor. So they have a hand, the receptor is a hand, that is able to attach to the tooth, tooth surface. And that's what you see going on as it attaches to the tooth surface of this image that has very extreme plaque on it, on the surface of the tooth. As those organisms, the oral streptococci, which is a broad group, and streptococcus salivarius is one of those, 
as they're attaching to the tooth surface, they are holding onto the tooth surface with one type of shaped hands that some of their buddies of the other seven billion in their little community, not so little, um, are actually not able to make that, that particular receptor, but are able to make a receptor in which they can hold hands with each other. So what you have going on inside of your mouth right now is this little hand-holding kumbaya type of event where they are gathering together, they're creating this biofilm. Now biofilm, biofilms can, can form on a lot of surfaces, but in your oral cavity, what does that mean? Well, you know when you wake up in the morning and you run your, your tongue over the surface of your teeth and you feel that slime layer? That's the biofilm. Okay? So those are microbes that have been grabbing onto your tooth surface and holding each other's hands all night, having a little party in there while you sleep. Now, we don't want them to have too much of a party. And the reason we don't want that is because if they start getting too active, if they start metabolizing too much, if they start dividing too much, then we end up with these demineralization events on your teeth. And that's where cavities actually come from. So when you go to sleep at night, and you've done some good oral hygiene before you go to sleep, you have about a 7.2 pH in your mouth. A pH scale is going to tell us how acetic something is. It goes from 0 to 14, and neutral is 7. So right at about neutral, 7.2, your teeth are intact. Everything's happening the way you would like it to be happening for your health. And the microbes are just kind of in resting status. So as long as you don't get up and have that apple pie as a midnight snack, you're going to maintain about a 7.2 all night. However, when you wake up in the morning and you have breakfast, you're not only feeding yourself, you're feeding your oral microbiome as well. So they find sugars that are available and they start digesting them. Now some of these microbes like oxygen, some do not like oxygen. And when they're actually making energy molecules for themselves, and they're actually metabolizing, and they're actually eating, they're giving off acids. They're the same types of microbes that are in yogurts. So that nice little um, tain and that acetic bite that comes from a yogurt is from the microbes that have actually fermented the milk. And you get that little alternate um, aftertaste of that tain of the yogurt. That's the acetic property of that fermentation reaction. So they're taking sugars, fermenting them, giving off acids. And with the pH scale, the lower you go, the more acetic something is. So when they start metabolizing and they enjoy the breakfast that you're enjoying, it dips to about 5.5 and then below. 5.5 is important because that is the critical pH for demineralization of teeth. Demineralization means that you are actually pulling the calcium out of your teeth. The acid molecule is able to kick the calcium out. It isn't there, and that's the start of a cavity. But what you actually do through your salivary secretions is you go through a remineralization process. You actually put calcium back into your teeth on a regular basis throughout the day. So the critical pH for demineralization, the actual kicking out of the, of the calcium atoms, at 5.5 is much like what we've looked at with acid rain falling on limestone buildings or structures. And we see the destruction of that limestone associated with the acid content of that acid rain. So this goes on throughout the day. You eat breakfast, it dips, goes back up, you've remineralized, it's back up to 7.2. You enjoy lunch, it happens again. You enjoy the afternoon cappuccino, which the bacteria also enjoys along with you, it goes back down again. And so when you hear television commercials say that chewing sugarless gum is actually healthy for your teeth and fights tooth decay, that's not just a marketing ploy. It's actually very true. Um, because if you can get your salivary glands working to produce saliva, then what you're actually doing is helping your remineralization and your pH go back up again. And of course, here comes dinner with a little bit more happening with demineralization and remineralization. Now, what we've looked at in our lab, and the thing that we're very concerned about, my research interest, is early childhood caries. Uh, the US Surgeon General in 2000 produced an oral health report for America that identified cavities in children as being the most common chronic disease of childhood. It is five times more common than asthma, and it's 100% preventable. So we have been looking at what types of, of um, Things go into developing early childhood caries, and caries is another word for cavity. And one of the things that we've been looking at is how can we inhibit the growth of one of those microbes from even attaching to the tooth surface in the first place. So we've been studying some different substances. 
with regard to that, some different chemicals with regard to that. And then secondly, um, we want to ultimately, down the road, be able to look at the other types of organisms that are causing um, very severe cavities in children. Um, and these would be severe early childhood caries. Those severe early childhood caries we now know are caused not only by these oral streptococcin, these friendly strep bacteria, but they're also caused by a new organism that was identified in May of 2011 called Scardovia wigsii. They don't like oxygen. So what happens basically in our teeth overall, whether it's early childhood caries, which by the way is cavities before the age of six. Once a child reaches six, it gets booted over as far as a clinical description goes to actually just being cavities. So early childhood caries up to the age of six. These oral streptococci in young children as well as in us use up all the oxygen. They like oxygen. They use it all up, and then when they get done using up all the oxygen, especially at the gingival crevice, there's much less oxygen there, and these guys that don't like oxygen, that are also part of our oral microbiome, start metabolizing. And that's where we get some very severe periodontal disease. One of the things that I always hear from people is, why are the primary teeth important? That's the main question I get. They're going to fall out anyway. They're just baby teeth. So if they fall out or if they have to be surgically removed due to an extreme caries type of situation, you're still going to have the adult teeth coming through. Well, the reason this is important is because it's long been known that these organisms, particularly the ones that don't like oxygen, can travel to various systemic places around your body and cause some very serious systemic long-term health effects, such as heart infections, abdominal abscesses, and if they cross the blood-brain barrier, actual brain abscesses. And so we not only really want to establish some good early childhood practices with regard to oral health, but we also want to be able to have the adult tooth emerge into, be born into. We want that adult tooth to have the greatest shot it has of being born into as healthy an envir <clears throat> environment as we can possibly have. And then we also want to make sure that those long-term systemic effects are happening as minimally as possible. So as those microbes leave the mouth, travel to various places, you end up having these systemic effects. That obviously sets home up a lifetime of long-term potential systemic effects for a child. It's been very commonly said that the window is a wind, or the mouth is a window into the overall health of a person. Now this summer, we've had um, students with us from Heritage University doing research, bacteriological basic science research in the lab. And then we've also had students from PNWU working for about the past year, year on some of our community prevention and education efforts. So I would like to hand this over to them at that point. And at this point, and let them discuss what they have worked on and learned. Good evening, everyone. So we uh, wanted to know what inhibits the growth of Streptococcus salivarius. One thing we found that inhibits its growth was tea tree oil. Tea tree oil is um, derived from the Maleluca alternifolia plant. And this oil is found in some dental products such as toothpaste and mouthwashes at a 0.02% concentration. So this past summer, we looked at tea tree oil and Streptococcus salivarius, and we kept it at the 0.02% concentration. And our studies showed that it could be easily measured and that the growth of this bacteria was inhibited. So this results in a decrease of the bacteria in the tooth, in the teeth, excuse me, um, to form biofilm and plaque formation. We've also studied different alternative sweeteners that are not necessarily artificial, but they're not considered table sugar on the growth of Streptococcus salivarius. We found that the two sweeteners that had the greatest negative effect on the growth of bacteria were salitol and stevia. Now, salitol in particular had the greatest inhibitory effect on the bacterial growth, and that is because salitol is not a fermentable sugar that produces acids. Therefore, the bacteria does not have the food it needs to grow, yet it gives the consumer a nice, sweet taste. Now, we predict that by using either salitol or stevia, we are inhibiting the plaque formation on the teeth. Now, aside from our studies in the lab, we're also focusing on prevention and education in the community. So as you can tell, there's been a lot of work done this past summer in the laboratory. But along with that, we've started a community coalition 
to deal with the rate of this early childhood caries in our children here in Yakima County. And the reason that we've started this expert-based coalition is because the rate of this infectious disease continues to rise. And that is in spite of the fact that there are multiple passionate, dedicated, and highly trained individuals working to decrease its rate. And the idea in bringing together these experts in the field and forming a coalition is that jointly, over time, we could create an approach that leads to a solution that could be implemented across the entire county and serve as an example to other similar socioeconomic areas. Now, the experts involved in the Yakima County Coalition Against Early Childhood Caries include dental professionals who have been instrumental in understanding the prevalence and incidence of this disease, primary care medical professionals who, with a quick screening of the mouth, can refer children with potential cavities onto dentists, local government organizations, and local student organizations. The students at Pacific Northwest University, as members of this coalition, are dedicated to the health and well-being of those in the Yakima County. Our goal as students is not only to increase the knowledge generally about early childhood caries, but to offer impactful solutions in the lives of those we serve. As students at Pacific Northwest University, we are working in the schools with children to help teach them the proper preventative behaviors such as brushing and flossing their teeth. We are working in the community at events, working booths to help spread general awareness of early childhood caries. We're all also working with, early, with expecting mothers for the early care of their newborn's oral cavity and their toddler's teeth. To prevent a disease is better than finding a cure. And early childhood caries, or ECC, is a preventable disease. ECC is correlated with lower socioeconomic households, poor nutrition, and greater morbidity and mortality down the road. In Yakima, 26% of our children live underneath the poverty line. In the state of Washington, it is 14%. And in the nation as a whole, 11% of the population lives underneath that line. Since the United States General Surgeon's oral health report in 2000, the prevalence of childhood caries has risen from 24% to 28% of the population. This is a problem that is not going away. For a disease that affects the poor among us, who are already struggling to stay afloat, simply because of a lack of education and understanding of the causes of ECC, that is unjust. We, as promoters of health here in Yakima, have deemed it right to do something about these numbers and the lives and families that stand behind them. Thank you.